Hi guys, it's Chad Larson with MLD Wealth Management of Canaccord Genuity. Uh, again, I'm joined here by Travis Robinson of S&P Dow Jones Indices, a division of S&P Global. Travis and I have done a number of these uh, Zoom videos uh, over the last uh, number of months. I uh, hope you're all enjoying them, but this one we thought we'd do it a little differently. We would uh, save you all from having to see our, our faces up close and we'll just do this from a, a voiceover. So my um, I've had many people say that I have a face for radios and uh, a voice to match, so hopefully this works. Um, but in uh, for updates, I did get a haircut, so I was actually pretty excited to show you all. So let's get into it today. Um, we're joined by Travis, and uh, thank you for being here. And we're just going to really talk really briefly and succinctly and, and more candidly about the evolution of indexing. So Travis, uh, over to you. I'll run, uh, I'll run the slideshow, but... Uh, Tell me how this evolution has happened. You bet. Uh, well, thanks for having me, Chad, and congrats on the haircut. I know that's a big milestone these days. So, uh, but g getting to the slides here, you know, I've got a handful I've pulled together. Um, I appreciate being a part of this series and we've covered a few topics, but maybe just going back to the 30,000 foot level and thinking more about how indexing has changed. You know, S&P Dow Jones got in the indexing game uh, around 1885. Um, so, you know, 100 plus years ago, we started out benchmarking and trying to measure the market. And it started with price weighted indices. And actually, if you flip to the second slide, Chad, you'll see the generation one indices, um, you know, the Dow, the S&P 500, big broad market indices. Um, and it took a long time really to evolve just from that, that beginning, right? So 1885, the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the Transportation Average launch. Um, the S&P 500 comes along in the 1950s as we know it today. Um, and we move from price weighted to market cap weighted indices. And what, what that means is, you know, when you weight an index just by the stock's price, you're really not me measuring the size of the company. You're just measuring the, the the cost per share, right? The price per share. And it's kind of an arbitrary impact uh, when you think about that, that. That really is just designed by the number of outstanding shares of the company, right? So if they double the amount of shares, their, their stock should have in value unless the, the overall value of the company goes up. So took a hundred and uh, took took 70 or so years to evolve to a big broad market cap index like the 500 where we want to capture the biggest companies and 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 get a good proxy for the overall market and that's what the s p 500 is and and has been now for 70 more years um, it represents about 80 percent of the u.s equity market and you'll hear folks say cap weighted or capitalization weighted market cap weighted. And that just means the biggest companies have the, the largest uh, allocation within the index. Um, generation two indexing has, you know, gone beyond just a broad market, market cap weighted index to specialized indices, things like mid caps and small cap uh, indices, sectors or uh, size and style indices. We start to chop that those big market cap indices down into smaller pieces but usually staying exposed um, to weighting the index by by size of company and by market cap and that's generation two generation three is is where we've been in the last uh, decade or so and that's getting more specialized um, that's building indices that focus on specific uh, patterns, uh, characteristics or return patterns. So it lets us start to address very specific risks or think about identifying a, a small subset of stocks with characteristic, uh, characteristics that are different than just the size of the company or the sector that they operate in. Um, you'll see on slide three here, Chad, if you can go one more forward, you'll see when you wait by market cap, uh, there is one big consequence of that that you've got to keep in mind, and that is as the biggest companies really thrive in their environments when they do really well, and then there are other times when they underperform, and right now we've been in a time where they really outperform, especially so far this year, the concentration in those biggest companies, and which most are technology companies today, the concentration starts to grow. 
And so I mentioned the S&P 500 represents about 80% of the U.S. market when you think of it by size. But the first five stocks in the S&P 500 are actually a fifth of the overall index. They're now more than 21% of the index. And we haven't seen a concentration in those five names this high since the late 70s. So, I'm uh, assuming this is uh, no, no gold, no prize for this, but this is tech, correct? Tech, that's what's driving it, exactly. Uh, the performance of Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, Google, et cetera. Okay. Um, it, and then the underperformance of other industries, right, and other sectors. And so, you know, one thing, and I mentioned this, that generation three of indexing where we start to really slice and dice the index into more granular pieces, it allows us to be very tactical, to be very surgical, to think about where you might want exposure or where you might want to trim out exposure. And you can see on slide four that this market has really – uh, ha has really started to split and fragment into different pieces of outperformance and underperformance. Um, and what I mean by that is if you look at the year to day performance as through Mar uh, May 27, you can see the 500 is only down 5.3% year to date. Uh, but if you owned a tech heavy growth basket, you'd be positive year to date. You'd actually be up 2.8%. And if you went out and bought value stocks or even low volatility stocks, you're down 15% year to date. Um, we've just seen this huge swing in the favor of a few companies of the tech giants. Um, and so that specific factor has been rewarded. And, and more importantly, because we don't have a crystal ball, we're trying to manage risks, we're trying to think about where, where the puck is headed, um, you, we, you have these, these tools, these individual slices that you can use. And so as a contrarian um, who may be interested in value stocks, the, the relative performance of value versus growth has never been worse. And so there's a, you know, this might be an opportunity to start to think about those types of, that type of uh, exposure. Hasn't a value um, investor been waiting for, you know, been sitting on the bench for so many years. I think one of the things that, you know, I think clients should be in, viewers should spend some time on this is you know the the average retail experience in and around comparing themselves to a benchmark when we're given so many choices as well um, sometimes portfolios during periods of volatility are, are like bars of soap the more you play with them uh, the smaller they can get uh, and yet all of these would have you know some exposures and we, we talked about low vol uh, recently and a kind of phenomenon of the subsectors, the JICs that, that were overly impacted through this liquidity crisis as early at the onset of COVID. Uh, this is uh, more than ever been very interesting and, and you're having uh, fair to middling to decent to horrible results all within the same gamut of, of a singular economy. Um, sometimes these ingredients, uh, um, you know, you, I think you need a professional when you're, you're looking at that. I think we've been talking about tilting from growth to value for years and it hasn't panned out for for so many um but i guess yep. being the last words this time it's different right well it yeah it, it it definitely feels different right now but what'll be interesting to see and and the low ball story is a great example mm -hmm. um the performance the differential performance has been has been big and surprising but uh, I don't know, and I can't, I don't, I don't know anyone, I don't trust anyone who does yet, um, what inning, who says they know what inning we are in this pandemic slash civil unrest slash, you know, reshaping of the globe. Um, you know, I hope we're in, <laughs> yeah, I hope, I hope we're in the eighth or ninth inning and it, it just feels like the darkest times and, and then we're going to wake up and it'll be gone as quickly as it showed up. Um, but if we're not, the, this this chapter of the book's not finished, right? So Loval may not have worked for the last eight weeks or 10 weeks, but what we have is a data set and a very robust process of approaching, uh, you know, evaluating which stock, stocks uh, have low volatility characteristics, rebalancing every quarter. We can look back at that, at that screen applied over almost 50 years and see what it, how it behaved over time 
and what and, and that it does reduce volatility and then it, it has enhanced return in the past and of course no prediction here that it will do that in the future but this eight to ten weeks is just such a small data set that um we we have to see how it'll play out and, and if the rebalance that just happened at the end of may has taken the portfolio back to calmer waters and then if that actually will have the impact um, that it's had in the past on the overall volatility and then the performance of the portfolio over the next quarter or the, over the next year. So um, still a lot to learn and see uh, and, un and unfold uh, as the rest of 2020 plays out. Yeah. So what, you know, what can we talk about, you know, as we kind of, this was like almost like a disturbing slide for me, you know, because everyone has different results in and around the market through positioning strategies where clients rebalancing through the dips. And now we're in this awkward period of you know, the markets are running, you know, potentially too much as we're at this early on swell of negative economic uh, data to come. We saw Canadian banks report. Um, I know we're predominantly talking about the U.S. Uh, the S and P, um, but you know we're seeing earnings down forty percent and the stocks trading up on that value. So some some a little bit not so much euphoria, but you know, uh, the bet that the world will move carry on, and I'm definitely in that camp. Um, but to understand that we can have exposure to an economy, but just style tilt can make all of that difference. And I think people need to understand, you know, and I have many clients that you know. Uh, is still maybe a little bit more old school and, and you know built their wealth and their own businesses or individual security selection. But the world is so good at disseminating information and the market is uh, about as good as it can get at pricing and risk and price. And, and when we're trying to compare you know a client's retirement goals to an index and they don't even own the constituents of an index, it, it, it makes my life um, incredibly acidic. Uh, and it's like trying to, I always say, trying to compare apples to fish. They're just not the same thing. And so we're, we're held to this kind of higher, higher uh, calling of having index like or benchmark performance uh, as that speedometer and looking that style alone, style drift can create different, very different, very high variability of results. And then I'm going to jump to slide five here and I'll, I'll kick it off is looking at these subsectors. And if you're overweight in financials and you were underweight or non-existent in discretionary tech and healthcare, you've had a bumpy ride through this. Like there, it makes a very good case that you do need broad market diversification uh, to sit and cherry pick single sectors, you know, whether they be, you know, energy or materials or tech, or it's just a recipe for, you know, short-term hero, uh, you know, long-term zero uh, in the under, if you're going to be comparing yourself to an overall indices that during any short period of time, you may look like a genius. Um, but I think luck is, uh, is a big part of that too. Um, so we, when we really kind of boil things back and I know in our industry, we're so, you know, we get trapped in our jargon all the time and you did a great job explaining what an index is and what the S&P 500. I think the best resonating what I really hear about what just the S&P 500 is, and we can talk about you know, the CAC 40, the DAX, the TSX 60, all of these indexes. Um, you, you know, it looks like a pie chart on my, or it looks like an algorithm from the matrix on my Bloomberg screen on any given day. Uh, and you just start to see the matrix over time is I want to own 80% of the U.S. economy, and so do it. And, and if you want to take a tilt over and above your uh, low-cost liquid exposure to that to take advantage of, a, of an edge or an obvious uh, scenario through an economic cycle where expansionary, contractionary, uh, you know, peak trough, different sectors are going to do different things. This, uh, the percent recovery is, is a really interesting... Uh, uh, telltale uh, speedometer or kind of gut check of where we're at today. Yeah. Yeah. And it, again, to your point, it speaks to diversification, right? Because we started this year with financials in a very strong position, um, mm -hmm. you know, real estate yielding nicely in a low, low rate environment. So while they had headwinds, there were a lot of good stories, strong stories 
in real estate or utilities are, are typically very boring, boring. So now we've had this huge dislocation and, and, you know, everything's been repriced. Uh, some things higher like tech, other things a lot lower. And so then the question is, you know, is healthcare going to, is healthcare now overpriced and, you know, industrials and energy underpriced. So it's, let, to your point, um, very risky to try and over time, over reallocate the portfolio. Um, you know, it just speaks to that core tenant of good diversification. Um, you know, have have a plan in place and stick to that plan because I don't know about you, but if if I if my mood is good, all I have to do is turn on the TV for 15 <laughs> minutes and it's that's over and I'm ready to sell everything. Then yeah. hopefully the next morning I'm ready to buy. And luckily, yep. I, I, I um, you know, I make sh- I, I sit on my hands and I don't make those moves because we, we know how those stories go. And being out in the field and traveling, uh, working with advisors day in and day out, you know, you just hear terrible stories. Folks that had huge allocations to cash in 2014, expecting the market to go back to 2010, 20, 2009 levels and 2010 levels. And it just never happened. Right. And, and so to try and make those big calls when your strategy is long-term uh, seems more risky than, than riding, riding the market out. But it also depends where someone is in their, you know, their stage in life and what that money is set aside for. Yeah. Yeah. Jumping on to kind of the consequences of the skewness, I, uh, I barely know what this means. So I'm going to let the expert kind of run with this one. Yeah, I, I just want to take a chance to get really nerdy uh, for five minutes here, Chad. Good luck. Um, and uh, yeah, let's see how, how well I can go about explaining this slide. I'll share the punchline up front before I explain the slide. And then, of course, you, folks can go out on the Internet and Google our research and, and, and read deeper and, and go down this rabbit hole if they want. But The point of this slide is, you know, a few stocks drive the majority of returns over the long run. And when I say a few stocks, I'm talking three to 4% of stocks, maybe 5% tops, depending on the environment. And so, and there's this data set that we have of 20 years. There's a data set um, Professor Bessenbinder at Arizona State University has that's 100 years um, and the very similar results. And that is, when you calculate the cumulative return of stocks and then plot those out, those cumulative returns out in a histogram, which is what this, this, that fan, this is the fancy name for a bar chart like this, where we tally up all the stocks and their cumulative returns. The way to read this is the first two bars on the left, those are all the stocks that had a cumulative return that was negative, down slightly or down 100, up to 100%. So about a one in three stocks, when you tally those two bars up, you get about 34, 35% of the data set. So about one in three stocks, cumulative was never negative. Made you for, money. Never made you, yeah. You, you own those stocks for 20 years and you lost money over 20 years with those stocks, which is surprising to, it was surprising to me the first time I studied this chart um, and let it soak in. And I think it's surprising to most investors that one in three stocks loses money. Actually, half of the stocks, so your median cumulative return is, um, is just uh, 52% over 20 years, right? So, you, you know, most investors could have gone out and bought a GIC ladder um, and, and laddered those things and made more than you would have with, the, with half of all the stocks. Because half of stocks, were their cumulative return was something less than 52%. That's what the median means, right? Half years. fall on the left. Yep, over 20 years, half, half, late, half the stocks in the data set over 20 years made less than 52%, cumulative. Wow. Very dismal. Now, the average stock made 239%. And that, when you, when you think about that annualized over 20 years, that's much more reflective of what we expect out of the stock market and what investors probably experienced if they owned stocks that had been in the 500 over the last 20 years. Right. And, and when you have an average that's so much higher than the median, usually average and median, you know, if you have a normal distribution, the average and the median are very close together. A distribution with positive skew or this bright tail that you see yeah. um, and, and an average that's four times higher, four and times and change higher than the average or than the median, the reason that happens is way out there on the right, 
about 5% of stocks were up over a thousand percent, which is interesting. That's your monster energy. That's your Tesla. That's your, yep. those once in a lifetime stocks, the Apple, Amazon, right? Apple. Yep. I think yep. I, I don't have it queued up for the slide. And if you don't have it on the tip of your tongue, we won't bumble through it. But someone, I think I saw something recently was the best performing stock in the S and P in the history. And it was like monster energy drink or something. That was something ridiculous, like 110,000%. Yeah, yeah. And I believe Monster's the best performing stock in the NASDAQ. Yeah. Um, one of the best performing stocks, everybody knows that's surprising, Domino's Pizza. So oh, that's bad uh, pizza. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they sell a lot. They sell a lot of that pizza. And actually, if you grew up eating a lot of Domino's like me, you can handle, you know, you can yeah, stomach yeah. it. It's right uh when you're in a pinch domino's is okay and they and they make their margins are a lot better than the local pizza chain right so yeah. um it, it's just in, incredible how hard and this is why it's so hard to go out also and pick individual stocks i mean as an active manager um you've got to be diversified and you've got to spread your bets around because if you don't if you don't own a meaningful amount of these few stocks that are up a thousand percent you're you're destined to definitely underperform yeah. Um, and it just makes it even more challenging. So again, you got, and that's, you know, it's, it's kind of goes back to the, the idea, like obviously you you guys are well aware of uh, significant exposure across the breadth of, uh, of our, of our fund and, and client portfolios. And I, I, I always say it's, and maybe this is less apropos in modern times, but I would say to people is, you know, if you like hot dogs, that's great. Sometimes you don't want to see how they're made and, some people retort with, well, I'm vegan, but neither here nor there. You never want to see how a Beyond the Meat burger is made either. It's a, it's a pretty nasty process. And, and having uh, some broad market exposure allows you to capture weightings to these. Because the other part of it is that the emotional, those, those behavioral finance principles that haunt and guide our behaviors uh, far more every time we think we're disciplined or we're smart is... Any time, any what times uh, someone owned a stock that was up, you know, fifty percent or hundred percent, very often they sell it uh, because it's validating to them as an investor, unwilling to pair with losses. And you know, it's it's all great to buy Monster Energy at a dollar and sell it at three dollars and pat yourself on the back and and not holding it until it goes to three hundred dollars and and making those. And even as a as a portfolio manager. Um, or as a wealth advisor to, to clients pursuing long-term goals, we come across scenarios all the time where, you know, it's how you create significant wealth can have by significant equity concentration in these parabolic type returns. And I, and I had a conversation with a client today. It was like, you know, this one stock, which has effectively changed your life, represents a third of your portfolio. You know, if, I, if you woke up today, you know, and you've held it for many, 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 many years. If you woke up today, just, you know, if I said, hey, uh, I think this thing can keep going higher. I, I found this stock XYZ incorporated. Let's put a third of your money into it. You know, I say you'd hang up the phone and you'd fire me and change advisor. But, you know, that, uh, you know, the hot hand fallacy and that uh, association or attrition to, to not making changes when something's going well, it's 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 more of an emotional battle than than fundamental. And I think that's why I, you know, as much as I'm in awe with all the propeller heads and the smart people that do all the financial analysis, there's definitely an art to uh, to advice and to to understanding what works for an individual investor and their family, and really starting with what their goals are. You know, if you start with what the goals are you can kind of work backwards to this and employ a group of professionals um, that you work with to help kind of make that cake. Cause it's pretty wild that only a few ingredients can make the, uh, the difference to making this cake taste good or tastes like mud. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, and just having somebody there to navigate all times like this, right. Yeah. Um, it's got to definitely advisors like yourself are earning their keep in this environment. So. Yeah, fair enough. Well, with that, we should probably wrap it up. I'll, uh, uh, we'll be chatting soon. And I, again, I have really appreciate it. I've had a ton of positive uh, feedback from clients and viewers and 
and uh, you know, tip of my hat to you, uh, to your group, and as well as Invesco for uh, uh, for putting this together. Well, thanks for having me. Great chatting with you, Chad. Take care.